I love the ESP32. If you watch any of my past videos, you'll see I use them loads. But there's one thing that drives me crazy with them. It's that they draw loads and loads of power. So here I've got a simple ESP32 C3 connected to my USB power monitor and you can see it's drawing 20 milliamps and all it's running is a simple blink sketch. Now 20 milliamps doesn't sound like a lot but when you think about it if I was to power it by this battery here which is a you know a pretty substantial battery 3000 milliamp hours I'd probably only get five or six days battery life out of it. That's not very good for projects where you want months and months of battery power, right? So in this video, I'm gonna be looking at an ESP32 development board. And what I think most people don't realize is that the ESP32 itself is, is just that I see there. Everything else is, is down to a design choice made by the designer. And if you're buying cheap modules like this off AliExpress, chances are you're not going to get the highest quality components in terms of the voltage regulator and other choices like you don't need the LED. Do you really need the external crystal? The answer to that is no, you don't need those things. And that's why I designed my own ESP32. So here's my development board. You'll see there is no external crystal. It uses a switch mode regulator and there's no power indicator. So in this video, I'm going to go through this board, how I designed it, but most importantly, I'm going to compare it. So I've got it wired up to a, a sensor and I'm going to send that sensor reading via ESP now to a base station. And it's all going to be powered from one of these batteries. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll compare basically the performance of this board to the performance of a, a sort of standard ESP32 development board that you might buy from say AliExpress. So that's the whole concept of this video. How long will this board last compared to, for example, this board? Let's crack on. I won't go into massive detail on the actual development board, but I'll just go through the key components. So I made the choice to go with a USB-C connector for the 5 volts to charge the battery and the data lines. So the S3 doesn't need the TTL to USB converter IC, which again saves a lot of power. So that's a good design choice in my opinion. So you still need a, a battery charging IC and I went with this MCP component. It's a 500 milliamp charger and it will charge your battery up to 4.2 volts. So there's nothing special about that. Basically, that's not going to be used most of the time when the board is on battery power. So that simplifies matters. The battery I went for was basically a lithium polymer 18650 cell, single 1S cell, um, 3000 milliamp hours. So the, the sort of maximum voltage of that you'll expect when it's fully charged is 4.2 volts and you really shouldn't use it below around 3.2 volts. So you can permanently damage those if you go too low. Directly connected to the battery and also the battery charger, if you think about it, is gonna be this book boost converter. And because I want to go below 3.3 volts, I actually went for a book boost. So if the input voltage is higher than 3.3, then the IC acts as a book converter to reduce the voltage to 3.3 volts. And if the voltage is below 3.3, then the IC acts as a boost converter to make it 3.3 volts. So this is a, a pretty specialist component. So it, it gives you a two amp output current. So that's more than enough for an ESP32, even under a sort of heavy Wi-Fi loads. But the key value there is the quiescent current and it's only 11 milliamps. So basically when the ESP32 is in sleep, that component is only drawing 11 microamps. That's really, really low. So if you're using a sort of linear regulator, it might be 10 times higher than that, or so maybe even higher. Um, it's really efficient. So at very low output currents, its efficiency drops to around 75%, but at sort of higher output currents, the efficiency is 90, 95%. And it's also really very cheap. So that's what's powering the, the sort of 3.3 volts on the ESP32. And here I just went for the, the room module with the onboard antenna. So not the one with the little UF socket, the one with the actual onboard antenna. But it's kind of crazy, right? If you add up the cost of all those components, it's a lot more than you can buy those development boards from, from AliExpress. It's a little bit sad, but then again, that's economies of scale for you. So I won't dwell on the technical details of the schematic. I'll just leave it up for a few seconds and you can pause the video and have a look at it if you like. 
But really, if you check out my blog, you'll be able to see the high resolution version of that and you can build it yourself. But just be aware that I've not really followed best practice here, right? You know, there's no short circuit protection on that battery. There's no over discharge protection. There's lots of cuts that I've made that you probably shouldn't make. So I plan to leave this in a well-controlled environment for a long time and, and nothing's going to short out because there's nothing going to change on the board. If it works when I first turn it on, it's going to work indefinitely. Over-discharge is a, a problem, but if you quickly look at the schematic, you can see on pin 8, I've actually got a, a voltage divider. I, I didn't use 5.1K, I used 510K there, by the way. And when the battery voltage drops to 3.2, I'm going to send a warning via ESP now to the, the base station that the battery needs to be changed. So I don't think there's much danger of over discharge in this particular case. So just be aware that some corners have been cut and you probably don't want to take the same steps that I did. And finally, here's the PCB layout. It's a pretty standard layout. I wish I'd made it a little bit narrower to sort of match the same footprint as other ESP32 development boards you can buy, but it's got all the things you'd expect. It's got several IOs broken out. I've actually broken out the UART and some I2C pins that have got the pull-up resistors as well for making it easy to connect to sensors. It's got the boot and reset button. And if you watch my previous video, you know I'd had an absolute nightmare on trying to solder that USB-C port. So just be wary if you copy this design and I'll, I'll make these files available to you, then that is very difficult to solder, as is U3, the book boost converter. So let's go and have a look at the performance of this thing. So here actually is the development board and I showed it in the last video, but actually it's a resoldered version. So in the previous video, I struggled with the USB-C port and it kind of worked. It was a little bit flaky though. Sometimes it connected, sometimes it didn't and I had to do a lot of the programming via the UART. But in this new revised board, I put much less solder on sort of this side of the board, made the soldering the USB-C port so much easier. And it actually worked first time. Even the U3 was fine, USB-C port, everything worked really great. So super pleased with that. As for how it differs from the schematic, well, I used two 510K resistors in a potential divider. The schematic shows 5.1K. And also slightly different, I actually soldered a, a capacitor across the battery terminals just to reduce the current spikes. And other than that, that's exactly what the schematic shows. It's exactly as I showed in the previous video. And it works really well. In terms of the sensor, which is a BMP280, it's just a pressure and temperature sensor. Not a very good one, just a cheap one. It's not really what I want to use in my project, but I'm just using as an example of something that you can read via I2C and then transmit the data from. What I'm going to be comparing that to is this. So this is a ESP32 C6 development board. It'd be nice to use an S3, so I'm doing like for like comparison, but I don't have an S3 board that actually has a battery input. So this can take a B plus B minus uh, a one cell lithium battery. Whereas I don't have any other boards that can do that. So I was stuck with this one. Um, I've set up exactly the same thing though. I've got exactly the same sensor and I'm going to use exactly the same code. So basically the code makes this go into deep sleep for two minutes, wakes it up, sends a message containing the pressure and the temperature and then switches back off again. So it does that every two minutes. Just to go over the testing plan then. So I've got my development board and I've got this 3000 milliampere single cell battery. But how am I going to measure the current going from the battery into the dev board? Well, that's where this Nordic Semiconductors Power Profiler 2 kit comes along. Absolute mouthful, but it's actually really convenient and not so expensive. It's less than £100 and it gives you a really accurate recording of the basically the current flowing through the, the device. So using that, you can go down to, I think, nanoamps or tens of nanoamps, perhaps, sort of resolution and quite a high time resolution as well. So that's a really good way to sort of determine how much power the device is drawing. So in both cases, I'm actually going to put that between the battery and the development board. I'm not going to use any external USB or anything like that. It's all going to be battery powered. And I'm actually just going to record the power during the deep sleep and during the transmit of the sensor data. So as I mentioned, the ESP is going to wake up. 
it's going to read the sensor it's going to send the data over esp now and then it's going to switch off and it'll do this every two minutes i'm using a, a standard esp32 dev kit c1 this is the official espressive devel development board as a base station so this receives the esp now transmission once received it creates a, a point on a graph and that graph is accessible on my home network by navigating to basically the ip address so really simple it just shows me the temperature and pressure and it automatically updates it's quite convenient so the moment of truth let's go and have a look at the power draw here i've got my development board connected via the battery only the battery you see there's nothing plugged into the usb port and I've actually got it going through the power profiling kit. So this is the best technique for measuring the um, power consumed by a, a device. So what I've got at the moment, as you can see on the screen, it's just recording like nanoamps. And basically it's because I've got it switched off. Look, enable power output is off. So when I switch that on, that'll basically connect the battery to the, the ESP development board. Let's have a look what happens when I click that button. And you can see immediately it sends a packet of data and the average of that is is basically nine milliamps right so the interesting thing will be now once that disappears off the screen this is kind of the the power in sleep mode so let me just show you on the on the server now i don't know how focused that is but basically if you're looking at the blue line um the, there's a big gap in points and that's when i had the power the power switched off the brown line is basically the, the C6. So now we've just seen on the screen a new, a new update. So that second dot there on the right hand side is basically that new update. The, the brown line is the C6, which I've got plugged in over my shoulder, but you can see it's transmitting and the base station is receiving it. I've just got the base station plugged in behind me on a USB battery. So I'll put that there. Let's slide that over so you can still see that. And let's just keep uh, an eye on this. So actually, when you do a transmit now, maybe not the first one, but the second one, you can see that the average is 7.8 milliamps. And then when there's no transmission, it's basically 270.3 microamps. That's really very, very low. Um, I'm pretty pleased that I'll be super honest with you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare that to the C6 so we can see exactly how they they compare so at the moment i've got this transmitting the data every 30 seconds it basically transmits the the temperature the pressure because it's a bmp and um, the battery voltage so on my development board i've got the the battery going via a potential divider to one of the io pins so i can read the read the battery voltage on the c6 which is the dev board i bought from aliexpress basically there is no battery monitoring so i'm just sending a dummy value of 4.3 so that's that's never going to change so you can see both sensors are sending the data at sort of 30 second intervals now i'm going to swap over i'm going to put the the um, c6 via the battery through the power profile and we'll we'll see how that behaves so I've set up the C6 now using exactly the same circuit. It's got the same sensor. That's the important. There's the C6 development board, just one of the cheap ones from AliExpress. Here's the same battery and I've got it connected to the, the profiler. And if you look at the power profiler, you can see again, when it's disabled, enable power outputs off, you, you're averaging nanoamps, basically nothing. So let's turn that on now, see what happens. So immediately, we do that that first transmission but let's not worry about that let's look at the, the subsequent ones so now we're drawing 278 microamps so 10 times more than what we were doing on the the development board which is pretty impressive when you think about it and these are not known for being very power intensive and i think the c6 actually uses less power because it's single core than the s3 um, this is running exactly the same code and everything's identical, sensors identical, batteries identical, everything's identical. The only difference is the power, the way the power's being handled on the board. So I'm pretty happy with that. That's kind of a good result. A 10 times saving is going to make the, the device run 10 times longer from the battery, right? So that's pretty cool. Let's just make sure it's being updated. If you look at the plot, which is a little bit difficult to see i agree um, it's just turned on now you know it was running in the background behind me from the battery i've actually turned the 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 
homemade development board off now that's not powered so there'll be no more updates there um, but you can see it's actually spitting out data at these regular intervals when you see it burst on the the power profile you can see a new point appear on the on the web browser so it's measuring the temperature and all's working well it's pretty cool let's just have a look now at the numbers so during the off time the average is 278.45 during the, the, the transmit time, the average is 7.28 milliamps. So I'll run those numbers now and we'll see exactly what the saving is. So just looking at the data and running a few back of the envelope calculations, you can see there's a massive difference in lifetime. So you almost double the lifetime just using these improved power handling components, really. So just to go over the calculations, the power profile gave me the 10 second average over the transmit period and the sleep period. So over the transmit for the, the DIY ESP32 S3 board, the average current was basically 27 microamps and the equivalent for the mini was 278, so a factor of 10 bigger. During the transmit period, basically average was the same, right? So you wouldn't expect them to be any different. They're doing the same thing during that time. And when you run through these numbers, assuming that the 3000 milliampere cell can run to about 85% capacity, and that's when its voltage will be about three, 3.1 volts or something like that. You see that it lasts almost six months longer, but you know something that's impressive, but it got me thinking, do I really need to transmit every time I do a read? And the answer is no, right? I could do several reads, which take much less power than transmitting and then send them all at one time on, say, the temp read. So that's what I'm going to do now, and then I'll see really how long I could squeeze a battery without sacrificing too much measurement resolution, really. I still could do a read every five minutes. I would just transmit that data every, say, 50 minutes. So I'm going to try. Let's go have a look. So I modified the code, and I've just been watching the power profiler for the last uh, 50 minutes. But anyway, that doesn't matter. We've got the data now. So just a reminder, we're reading the sensor every five minutes, but we're only transmitting the data on the 10th read cycle. So we'll transmit all 10 data points after basically 50 minutes. So let's have a look at the scores on the doors. So if we look there, that's a 10 second window and the average is what, 850 microamps. And that's a sensor read. In the off time, basically the deep sleep time, it's unchanged at 27.34 microamps. And here after 50 minutes, we're averaging 7.54 milliamps over 10 seconds. So let's get those numbers and run a quick calculation to see how much power this board's consuming now and how long the battery is going to last for. Putting all these numbers together, we see we've got around 90 seconds at 8.49 milliamps, so less than one milliamp. We've got 10 seconds whilst we're actually sending all that data at 7.56 milliamps. And we've got the long sleep period at 27.42 microamps. And when we add up all those numbers, we can basically see over a 50, 50 minute period, we're only drawing on average 0 0.0772 milliamps. So if you think about the battery, 3000 milliamp hours, you can actually calculate how long that battery should last. And normally I'd say around 85% capacity you can use in a battery. So that's two and a half amp hours. If you were being a little bit naughty and pushed it a bit further, you could actually get four years battery life out of this thing. Now that's pretty impressive, given that you're going to be getting data every five minutes from it. Although you're not transmitting it every five minutes, that's true. But anyway, that's super impressive, but I'm still kind of curious, where's that power going? So let's have a look at that. Using the various data sheets and the known resistor values from the schematic, you can actually calculate where the current's actually going. And it actually calculates really well. It adds up to exactly what we measure almost. The data sheet for the book boost converter says 11 microamps QSync current. The ESP32, when it's in deep sleep, draws somewhere between 5 and 10 microamps. So that's, you know, average 7.5 microamps. We've got the resistive divider on the actual book boost converter that provides the feedback. That draws 5.5 microamps, quite high. I maybe need to tweak that. I also have the resistive divider on the battery which draws 3.63 microamps. So when you tot all this up, you get around 27 microamps, and that's exactly what I measured with the power profiler. So that's super neat. But anyway, that's the end of this video. I hope you found it useful. 
at the end of the day, I'm pretty impressed with my um, development board. All the details are going to be on my blog. So if you want to make one yourself, feel free. And thanks for watching. If you've got any questions, put them down below and I'll see you in the next one.